So I am going to talk about kind of two things here. There's two goals for this talk. One is I'm going to introduce a new challenge task, which I think is really interesting from the point of view of representation learning. And I'm going to present the current solution that we have, which is based on inducing hidden programs. And I'm going to try to argue how programs can be a very compact and powerful representation. So this talk might be a little bit unusual for, I guess, this audience, but hopefully it'll be uh, interesting. Okay, so I'm going to start by giving a high-level overview of uh, the t area of question answering. I'm going to then talk about the specific um, challenge task and the, the project that uh, we've been working on. And then I'm going to end with some philosophical waffle. So I got this uh, term from Jeff Hinton, and it just kind of stuck um, with me. So question answering has been around for a, a long time. So ever since kind of computers came on the scene, you know, people were in uh, natural language processing were trying to build question answering systems. So the early systems were all rule-based. So systems like baseball, student, lunar, um, if you've heard about any of these, basically have a rule-based system with some grammar that parses sentences into some logical form and you query a small database. So this is a lunar system. Um, when they brought moon rocks back, they were able to answer questions like, what is the average concentration of iron and elamite? Um, but of course, you know, these systems didn't really scale beyond uh, these uh, small domains. Um, Sorry, this should be like 19, 2000s. Uh, so in the 2000s, uh, with the rise of the internet, there was actually a lot more data, and then the question answering landscape changed uh, dramatically um, to basically retrieval-based QA. So if you have a question like, what company sells the most greeting cards? You don't look this up in a database, you go to the web, do a little uh, search, and find sentences which are relevant, and then you use some sort of statistical uh, machine learning to try to classify which of the words in the sentence that you found is actually the correct answer. So uh, generally, these rely on typical types of patterns. You can learn these two things like um, you know, IBM Watson relied heavily on these retrieval-based methods. And you know, there was a series of Trek uh, competitions in the early 2000s, and people were able to get 70% you know, on these kind of simple factoid questions. So notice that you know, the, the challenge here is really bridging the gap between these words and the questions, which uh, don't really match the questions, the words in the Okay, so then, um, actually a little bit before that, there was an area inside NLP, so quite a small area, pioneered by you know, Ray Mooney and some other people on uh, semantic parsing. And here the idea is that you know, we're going to kind of go back to the database view. So you start with sentences like, what is the second largest city in California? And try to map these into some sort of logical form, or you can think about it as a program or a database query, such that if you execute this Base, you get the answer, right? And now the difference is that instead of doing this rule base, we're going to try to learn this component. We're going to learn these semantic parsers. So Ray Mooney and uh, Luke Zetamore and my colleagues uh, pioneered a lot of this, this early work. I, I started working on this, I guess, um, about four years ago. And we started training these systems not on questions and logical forms, but questions and answers. So we're trying to uh, infer the latent logical forms. And then later we uh, try to scaling this up to larger knowledge bases beyond the simple uh, US geography databases that these earlier works have been done on. So this is kind of uh, one snapshot of, uh, of question answering on Freebase, which is task. Um, here is a database uh, data set of uh, typical questions you might get. And here are some kind of results. Uh, you know, we released this data set in 2013. And over the, the course of time, there have been a number of methods, some based on semantic parsing, some based on um, vector space embeddings, and, and so on. And the things in red are our system, so we're doing so quite well here. But you know, there's actually quite a, I think there's some other papers which are um, you know, competitive, which are coming out this year. OK, so w given that, I guess, brief uh, prelude, what's next in question answering, I guess? So there's kind of two axes which you can think are interesting to expand on. One is the breadth. So we want to go beyond these really limited databases, toy worlds, to uh, the web and try to answer all the questions that you might have answers on the web. And 
at the same time, we want to increase the depth of reasoning. So compare these two questions. What was the, uh, where was Barack Obama born? So that's kind of a, t a simple lookup in a database, or just, you know, my, the answer probably appears in one sentence, versus a question like this, how many presidents after Abraham Lincoln were born in Ohio? And this, you can tell, is a question that requires more reasoning, more steps of computation to aggregate information and compute the answer. So these are the type of questions we're interested in, and we're not going to today talk about how to do this on unstructured web. We're going to try to do this on um, the closest thing we can do, which is uh, web tables. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, this particular project, uh, semantic parsing on tables. This is an ACL paper that's coming out this year with my student, um, Asifat. Um, so I just want to give you an idea of the type of questions we're trying to target. So the setting is that we're given this table. So it's a Wikipedia table, so it's um, not you know, uh, completely crazy, but it's not in a standard uh, you know, database schema format or something. And you want to answer questions like this. In what city did Peter's last first place finish occur? Um, so how would you answer this? Well, you go to uh, the position, you know, first you look for the last first place, and then you look over here to the city and find bank card. Okay, so this is kind of the, uh, the steps that you would have to take to answer these kind of questions. Let's do another one. How long did this competitor take to finish the four by 400 meter relay? Well, you look at, um, you somehow have to figure out that this column is the time even though you know, this says notes up here for some reason. Um, and then you uh, look at um, the 4 by 400 in 2005, and you, know, you look at the time, and it's, I guess, three hours or so. And um, where was the competition immediately held before the one in Turkey? Uh, you would find Germany here, and so on. So you get the idea. So these questions are not the simple types that you would just you know, look at uh, a place in the table and you just put, you know, necessarily pull it out. You might actually have to do some computation. Okay, so we gathered a data set um, by basically asking mechanical Turk workers to uh, answer, create trivia questions and also answer them. So we have about 22,000 uh, questions. And you know, this is actually quite broad. So Freebase, which is a large knowledge base for those of you who know it, can only answer about 20% of these questions. And we're working in the setting, which is, I think, interesting, is that the tables at test time are not seen during training time. Right? So at training, we see a bunch of tables, and we answer questions on those tables. At test time, we're getting fresh tables. So we have to learn a model that generalizes across uh, different tables. So about 13.5% of these questions are basically simple table lookup. And the rest involve a number of different types of operations, like you need to count things, you need to take the first or last, uh, compute the argmax. Um, you actually have to do some addition and subtraction here. And there's just a bunch of other random stuff that you know, people think of, which is not easily characterized. OK, so, so that's basically the task. And um, I'm going to talk a bit about how we go about approaching it, which hopefully will give a little bit more intuition about what is difficult in, um, about this task. So we take the table, we for, uh, convert it into a graph, just for ease of representation. And then uh, we're going to use logical forms or um, database queries to query this graph. So here is a logical uh, language that we use. I'm just going to go through it in, as a series of examples. So you know, entities correspond to logical forms that just uh, denote that entity. Uh, you can do joins. So these, this is a people. Uh, this, this is a set of entities which were born in Chicago. Um, you can do intersection on logical forms, so, so composing two logical forms and intersecting. So this is the set of people who were born in Chicago. You can count. Uh, you can take the argmin or argmax with respect to something. So this is uh, um, the person who was born earliest in Chicago. Um, you can do you know, various types of anaphora, where this is the people whose children influence them. Um, and um, you can actually form kind of relations uh, using um, lambda. So those of you who kind of know lambda calculus, this is kind of doing something similar, where this denotes the people who have the most number of grandchildren. So I won't I expect you to parse this, but um, the idea is that you have a bunch of 
primitives, like the intersection count argument, and by composing them using just a very a simple set of rules, you can actually form a lot of different kind of programs and meanings. So this shouldn't be uh, surprising if you think about how programs uh, work. Okay, so now the game is we're trying to figure out what program kind of corresponds to the meaning of a question so we can answer it. Um, so this is kind of a, uh, before I go into, I guess, the formal details, I just want to give you intuition for how the learning algorithm would expect to learn something like the representation. So the learning algorithm only sees question and answer. So here, this is in some funky language, um, which um, I assume not many of you know. Um, and, but this is exactly what the learning algorithm sees. So it sees some funky symbols, and named entities are kind of easy, like Mozart, so you can kind of recognize those. But, um, so what do we do? So we can generate, the learning algorithm will generate a set of hypotheses. Um, these are possible logical forms that could correspond to the meaning. It doesn't know which one of them is correct, but it can execute each of them on the database, and then you can scratch out the ones which are, uh, don't match the answer. Okay, but so now you've reduced it down to place of death and place of marriage, um, but you don't know. Um, fortunately, you have more than one example in your training set. Um, and so here's another one. Uh, and you can see this is kind of the same squiggly uh, symbols. And you do the same thing, and you cross out the ones which are incompatible with the answer that you saw. And now you can kind of see statistics emerging. So if, you're, uh, if your learning algorithm is working, you should see that you know, this symbol, which I can't pronounce, is um, the uh, place of death. OK, so this language turns out to be Cambodian. Um, OK, so, so the main challenge here, so that was just kind of the high level cartoon picture of what's going on. So the, I want to zoom in a little bit on the, the critical challenge here. And the critical challenge is that we don't see the logical forms. So we're going to go through and generate tons of logical forms. And you know, remember, the programs are designed so you can actually get an exponential number of these. Um, so you know, we do some pruning, but you know, eventually, you know, hundreds of logical forms later, you might uh, see the correct one. So this is you know, Greece held its, uh, you know, this is finding the row whose uh, country is Greece. That's um, the latest uh, argmax index, and you look at the year and you pull out the the day, which is 2004. Okay, so but but I mean it's it's actually a little bit worse than that because there are also logical forms that get the right answer 2004, but for the wrong reasons. So here is one that basically looks at the last row, goes back to this is a previous, and then just picks out the date. Okay, so this managed to get the right logic, uh, the answer, but it's also wrong. So I mean, this, this problem you should really think about is kind of a finding a needle in a haystack. The supervision you get is just the answer. It's just, it's just a number or an entity. And the thing that you're trying to infer is this kind of complicated logical form. And in the beginning, if you don't know anything about language, uh, I mean, the, the model doesn't know anything about language, so it basically has to explore a lot of different hypotheses, which uh, might seem ridiculous. And the fact that there are some um, things in some logical forms that get the right answer for the wrong reasons means that you basically have in your haystack a bunch of rusty nails. So you can think about the learning algorithm as basically this metal detector that's going around finding things that stick to it. And sometimes you get some needles, sometimes you get some rusty nails. And over time, you have to like, filter out the rusty nails. OK, so that's, a, that's kind of a generation procedure. and. Um, how do we model this? So even if I told you what the right logical form is, there's still this um, uncertainty in terms of you know, how does this utterance, which is the sequence, give rise to this other you know, uh, sequence of symbols. So here we're going to do something very uh, kind of simple and generic. We're just going to define some features, um, x and z. Um, on the utterance and the logical form. So we do some, you know, this is kind of uh, simple stuff. You define features that look at different, all the words in the utterance and all the words in the predicate. And um, you look at which predicates are missing. You look at the, the answer. This is a denotation. So you see if you actually got any answers back. You look at, the, you know, the engrams of the utterance and the type of the denotation and so on. So, you know, basically classic NLP stuff, you just lay down. Um, you know, five feature templates that gives you maybe like um, 
you know, uh, 50,000 features or something. Okay, so of course, you know, this part could be with something more sophisticated, but we're just going to you know, with that. Um, so if you have a feature vector, you can define a score function. Currently, we use something linear. You can imagine something more complicated. This gives you a distribution over logical forms condition on the utterance. And then how do you learn the model? Well, I already give you a kind of schematic picture of what's, of what's going on. But you know, the a likely, uh, objective that we use is basically maximize the probability that you get the answer right condition on the utterance. So that's you know, a pretty sensible thing, I think, to do. And in the process, you have to marginalize out all the possible logical forms that could have generated your answer. And just kind of a few details we use to cast a, uh, at a grad. Um, you know, three iterations. We have to do a bunch of pruning, um, which I'm not going to go into. I think it takes about 10 hours to train on 23,000 examples. Okay, so um, here's some results. Uh, so this is a new data set, so there's not anything to really compare against, but we can look at kind of just to get a feeling of how challenging this data set is. We develop a baseline system, which is basically um, look at various cells in the table and try to predict whether this is the correct answer based on a combination of features on you know, the utterance and the columns and you know, the context of the, the, the cell. And that just works uh, pretty horribly. So 12.7 uh, test accuracy. Um, if we use you know, previous, our previous system, which was built uh, for answering questions on Freebase, this does a bit better. So this is UNC semantic parsing. So we're able to kind of actually reason about the types of um, you know, phenomenon in the natural language. This does better, does better, but you know, it still doesn't do quite as well. And our current system gets 37.1% uh, accuracy. Um, so, you know, in some sense, we're doing something non-trivial, but on the ha other hand, I think there's still a lot of room for improvement. So this is kind of a first stake in the ground. And I just want to take the opportunity to mention, so this result is um, released on, so we have this website, uh, Coda Lab, which you can go to, I'll link to it at the end, and you can see basically uh, kind of an IPython-like notebook worksheet that has all the code data and the experimental results. So you can look at this experimental result and you can see like 37.1 here. Um, so you know, all the experiments are you know, reproducible and you can go and see uh, for yourself. Okay, so let's come back to this question of getting things right for the wrong reasons, right? So you know, if you have, how many times did Greece hold the Summer Olympics? Um, the correct answer is you, know, you just count the number of uh, rows that have country Greece. But also this one gets the right answer if you subtract the number of times Norway held the Olympics. And this is also the right answer. Um, so, so this is just to calibrate a little bit. Um, this is a percentage of um, utterances which we can get the right answer, and this is the ones which we can get the right actual logical form, so get, getting the right reason. And you can see that you know, there are uh, still in the evaluation, you know, maybe, I don't know, like uh, a third of the questions were getting the right answer for the wrong reasons, but you know, it's not like all the time. Okay, so here are some examples of predictions we get correct. Um, you know, according to a table, what is the last tile that Spicy Horse produced? Who finished directly after the driver who finished uh, in this time? And so on. So these are kind of representative sample chosen at random. And what does our system not get? Well, there are a bunch of kind of, um, um, so language has this property where you know it has a very long tail, not just of kind of the entities and the words, but even of the kind of a phenomena that you think might be compact. So you know you have words like consecutive and same, which actually you know semantically is kind of quite complicated if you think about it. And there's actually many more of these kind of words. So there's kind of just many things that we're uh, not covering right now. Um, and because we're working on uh, trying to answer these questions from tables, you inevitably have to do some sort of normalization. For example, the cell contains Bangkok, Thailand. You have to know that the first thing is the city and the last thing is the, the country. Um, how long does the show last? Well, in the table it says 2 p.m. to 3 p.m., so you have to figure out that these are two times and you have to subtract. 
So lots of uh, things. And you know, one of the things that, you know, remember one of our features was just kind of uh, lexical match. Well, you know, you have to reason that Mexican and Mexico are kind of related. But I mean, worse, I think, you know, this is something, so this you might imagine like, you know, uh, word vectors might help with, but something like this, um, is if you're asking for, you know, kind of what is the fastest airplane or something. In the table, it might not say airplane, it might say model. And now you have these words, how do you know that airplane, the word corresponds to model and not the date or something? And this is something that we've, you know, we've tried looking at various types of word representations and they just, uh, you know, don't capture this type of. So if anyone has any great ideas, I'd love to hear more about that. Okay, so just to kind of uh, summarize, so the paradigm that we're working in is we take questions, or more generically, utterances. We are going to map them onto programs or logical forms, and we're going to execute these logical forms to produce the answer. And importantly, we're going to try to learn this process without any annotations of the logical form. So we're going to try to learn from behavior only, input and output. Okay, and so, you know, this is quite a generic framework and we've been uh, using this for some other tasks besides question and answering. So just a brief preview of another paper that, of ours that's coming out in 2015. This is uh, during work with um, Ipandra Ashtosh and uh, Keja. And here the idea is that you want to map natural language utterances, which are high level instructions onto a sequence of low level actions that a robot can go and uh, take care of. So when you say microwave the cup, you know, it's, it's not that you, the, there's a primitive in the robot that is like microwave. The, the thing you have to map onto is move to the microwave, open it, keep the, put the cup in the microwave, close it, and press it. So, you know, this is kind of the type of problems that we're trying to address using, again, these, uh, where we use post conditions uh, of, as the logical forms that we're just gonna map into. Okay, so, um, I'm going to, I guess, try to uh, step back a little bit and think about this task and in the context of a larger scheme of things in terms of learning and representations. Um, so, 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 you, so I guess I, these days I get this question a lot. So you know, why are you using deep learning for your task? I used to get the question like, how is your system different from IBM Watson? But now it seems like the most popular question is, why are you doing deep learning? So I went to Wikipedia to figure out what deep learning was. And um, it says, <laughs> well, I don't know if you disagree with this stuff. I mean, it seems reasonable. It's, you're modeling high-level abstractions in data by, uh, with complex structures composed of multiple nonlinear transformations. Uh, so according to this definition, it seems like I am actually doing deep learning um, <laughs> because, you know, we're trying to learn this mapping with the program in the middle, which is, um, it's certainly not linear, it's not even differentiable, and it's trying to learn these, capture these high-level abstractions that help you generalize. Okay, so that's, that's my answer. Okay, a little bit more seriously, I guess. There is, a, you know, a question of, you know, these programs are not the typical representations I use in deep learning, which are more based on matrix vector products. They're more based on these logical operations like argmax. And, you know, the, I think the two have kind of complementary <coughs> strengths and weaknesses. So on one hand, we can't represent, you know, fuzzy concepts like, you know, tall or near very well. But on the other hand, we have these extremely powerful operations like argmax that allow you to, you know, do very complicated uh, aggregation operations. So I want to talk, or think a little bit more about representation. Um, so I, you know, here's some two sentences. You know, it's raining outside. Um, there are at least two people in this room. So, so one question is, what is the type of a sentence? And what do I mean by this? Um, you know, how, how should you think about uh, the representation of a sentence? And you know, one answer might be, well, you know, a sentence is kind of either, at least these sentences are kind of true or false. So you might think, okay, well, the type is a bool. Um, but that's actually kind of not right because, you know, the language is very context dependent and, you know, this really depends on, you know, the environment that you're in. So currently, um, 
it is raining outside, but that depends on the world. So, so the, I think the, the right way to think about this is that you know, sentences are uh, a kind of a map from the world state to a bool. Which means that if you're representing a sentence using uh, vectors or matrices or tensors, you know, it kind of needs to behave like a, a function. It needs to, to be able to take this world and um, output something meaningful. And you know, I think this is important because actually you can do things with language. You can talk about language actually without looking at the world. You can you know, say, there are at least two people in this room. Um, you know, I'm going to go talk to one of them. And that kind of makes sense, if you, even if you have your eyes closed or if you're talking about a fictitious world or something. Um, so I think there's uh, some sort of factorization. And this is kind of the idea behind you know, model theoretic semantics, which is the idea kind of uh, semi from logic. But, but I think it, you know, there's a more universal principle behind you know, kind of logical operations. And it's more um, about factorization, I would say. So the idea, what are you factorizing? You're factorizing the understanding of language with um, knowing the facts. For example, I can give you this sentence, what is the second largest city in California? And if you don't you know, your geography, that's fine. You can probably still understand the sentence and you can kind of read with it. And also you can not know English and you might be a geography buff and you might know things about the world. And it's really the two of these things that come together to answer the question. So, so I guess one thing that I think these uh, you know, programs or logical forms do well is that they make this factorization kind of explicit. And I think that gives you a considerable amount of generalization because you know, language, I think, can operate in its, uh, kind of by itself. And then when you put it with a world, that allows you to make uh, you know, significantly more complicated inferences. OK, so another point I guess I want to draw is you know, I think in order to learn, you need uh, data. That was not a very deep comment. But um, you know, in this uh, domain of semantic parsing, uh, data has not been a very, uh, has kind of been a scarce resource. And over these, the last two years, we've been really trying to you know, gather data sets of uh, larger size so we can kind of do more interesting learning. But as you can see, um, the number here is still you know, much smaller than ErgeNet. I mean, to be fair, this, these numbers aren't really directly comparable because I think you know, question answering and these kind of more complicated operations are kind of um, much more complicated tasks than you know, classifying uh, a single image and they're kind of harder to you know, get in some, in some sense because um, they require reasoning and you know, if you have you know, mechanical Turk workers to answer these complicated questions, it takes more time than for someone to say that's a cat. Um, so th that's the state of affairs, and, but of course there's a lot of you know, unlabeled data. But you know, on the data question, I do want to make one kind of point, which is that you know, often we think that there's a lot of data, but, um, and all we need to do is kind of build more, uh, better training algorithms. But I think you know, the data collection process is something that's interesting to look at as well. Um, and there's certain regimes where you don't you know, have data. So for example, if you're trying to build, um, let's say you're trying to, you have this, you know, you have Google Scholar or Sitesy or whatever, you have this uh, database of papers, right? And you want to build a natural language interface into it so you can ask, like, who was the most cited author at iClear this year or something. Um, so you don't have any examples. So how many examples do you have? Zero examples, because this system doesn't exist, so why would people be asking that question? So what do you have? You have the database. So uh, this is a paper that you know, is appearing at ACL this year. And the idea is that we're going to turn the data collection process around. And we're going to think about starting with the domain, the database, and uh, using a grammar to generate logical forms. So we're going to generate logical forms, and then we're going to uh, generate um, these canonical utterances that correspond to logical forms. So here is, you know, for example, an article with the largest publication date. And you know, these utterances are uh, awkward because we're generating them from like a simple set of rules. But then the idea is that we can go and you know, paraphrase these utterances. We can go to Turk and say, hey, take this uh, awful English and make it into you know, smooth prose. And the you know, Turker comes back and says, OK, what is the newest published article? 
So actually using this methodology, we were able to actually get quite a large you know, data sets in a uh, you know, very small window. So the idea of you know, this, we call it overnight semantic parsing. The idea is that if you want to, you know, if so your boss comes to you and say, I need a semantic parser by tonight uh, or by tomorrow, you can actually go through this process. And we did it for a domain, um, I guess, for uh, recipes. And we can actually build a semantic parser you know, overnight in, a, in the, one of these domains. So, so I think you know, there's much more to be said about the data collection issue and issues of um, maybe you can have an interactive system which is giving you data and you're kind of predicting. Um, I'm not, I don't have time to go into details, but happy to talk later. Um, so one other thing I want to bring up is that you know, the types of problems I think you know, this question answering, this type of question answering really stresses is prediction problems where there's multiple steps of computation and reasoning, right? And you can know, see that by, you know, when I was answering a question, I was going through the steps in the table to, to figure out. And on the other hand, I think this uh, task also stresses you know, the training, um, you know, because you're trying to basically find needles in haystacks. Um, this is kind of related to you know, when you're in reinforcement learning and when you have uh, really delayed rewards. How can you learn in this setting? I think it's kind of an open um, you know, machine challenge, machine learning challenge. So back to the issue of representations, I think there are actually some interesting ways that we can combine, you know, these, uh, I guess, apply these, um, you know, the methods that are kind of, have come about in this community to the types of uh, problems that, you know, I've talked about earlier. So, you know, one natural thing that, you know, some of these things we're actually exploring right now, so can you use, um, Instead of defining a kind of just a simple uh, linear model over logical forms and utterances, can you use something much more powerful to map between the two? Um, we are also exploring, can you take these logical forms, which are kind of discrete by nature, which is not so good for certain types of tasks, and smooth them out and in a way that kind of generalizes and still has the compositionality? Or if you want to be more ambitious, I guess you know, there's a talk right after on memory nets. Um, can you use these more recent advances in memory nets and neural Turing machines and the like to answer these complicated questions? So I think about this as a kind of a challenge task for um, you know, new methods that come out. And I think it's useful to think objectively about, in terms of learning representations, the types of computations we want these representations to do. So you can think about, you know, sure, you know, you know, neural nets are kind of universal in some sense, but, you know, the idea of having, being able to, having a um, kind of finite time budget and kind of processing and churning and aggregating is something that, you know, hasn't maybe received as much attention, but is uh, coming on the scene in recent years. Okay, so just to conclude, let me restate the, the goals. Uh, so hopefully I've you know, convinced you that this question answering task is a quite an interesting challenge um, because it's you know, end to end learning and has interesting representations that you need to actually induce to uh, do well on this task. And finally, you know, I think the idea of programs, which is you know, basically being able to compose um, 